are your instruments liquid? Well, they probably should be. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 488 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. So, if no one can take your measurement, where do you go? Do you code it yourself? But what if you don't have time for all of that? What if someone could do all of the tricky bits for you? Well, this is exactly what we're talking about today. My guest is Ben Nazette from Liquid Instruments, and we're talking about how Liquid Instruments is changing the face of test and measurement. We examine each of the Liquid Instruments hardware platforms, chat about their Moku Cloud Compile solution, and investigate why this kind of flexible, modular, reconfigurable, and shareable instrumentation is the way of the future. And also a little later on, keeping with our innovative theme this week, I check out the first commercially viable, flexible plastic microprocessor chips. Developed by a team of researchers at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and British flexible electronics manufacturer, Pragmatic Semiconductor. All right, it's time to bring in Ben from Liquid Instruments. Hi, Ben. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Okay, so for my audience who may not know, what is Liquid Instruments all about? Liquid Instruments is a high-tech test and measurement company. We're a bunch of engineers and physicists who actually left the Australian National University about six or seven years ago. We'd all been working making some of the most challenging measurements in the world, measuring gravitational waves. And the technologies that we had used for that, we started using in other places in the lab. We started sharing software-defined instrumentation with each other by email, sending things to each other. And we stopped and thought, you know what? Sure, we're locked down here in this little optical lab, but surely this kind of highly reconfigurable, flexible, shareable instrumentation is useful for other folk. So we decided to take a swing for the fence and have a go at turning that into a company. And here we are, as I say, about seven years later and Liquid Instruments has a range of software-defined instrumentation that is now being sold all around the world. That's excellent. Okay, so let's talk about software-defined instrumentation. So Ben, what do you see are the biggest benefits for this kind of instrumentation? Yeah, look, software-defined instrumentation has been around for quite a while touting flexibility. The pitch from people like National Instruments over the years has been things like, if no one else can make your measurement, then here's the way that you code it yourself, basically. So really high barrier to entry, but ultimate flexibility. And what we were looking to do with Liquid Instruments is to take that flexibility and the modularity and the shareability of all the measurements that you're going to make and the data that you get out of those measurements and remove the barrier to entry. So we try and do all the hard bits for you write instrument code ourselves, and then deploy it onto the Moku platform in your lab. So we now have, I think, 12 or 13 different instruments that are written by Liquid Instruments, high quality, but software defined, so they can be deployed straight to your Moku hardware, bought individually, and so on. And those are things like oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers at one end, through to like laser locking PDH boxes and filter boxes and PID controllers at the other end. So yeah, flexibility is the real win of SDI, Software Defined Instrumentation, but Liquid Instruments sort of extra special secret source there is the ability to run that SDI inside of the hardware rather than on your computer while maintaining the flexibility and lowering the barrier to entry. Excellent. That makes sense. Now, can we dig into the details of your hardware platforms? I know you have three different platforms, right? The Moku Go, the Moku Lab, and the Moku Pro. So can you Describe each of them and how they're different. Moku Lab is the OG Moku. We built that back in 2015. I think it might have hit the market. And that was really targeting the market segment that we knew as physicists. So low input and output voltages, medium bandwidth, but very low noise and maximum flexibility. So over the years, we've sold you know, a couple of thousand of those. 
And most of them now probably sit on optical benches in research institutions around the world. That's where that one was targeted. But we found a couple of really interesting things when we started selling Moku Lab. One of them was great to hear, which is just people saying, we love this. It needs to do more. I need to use it in more places. It needs to be faster. It needs to be more channels and so on, so on, so So we released the Moku Pro halfway through last year as an entry into that higher level market that's really allowed us to get into more like industrial spaces and test and validation, not just that core academic market segment. But the one that really surprised me, my background, I've got a background in university lecturing at the Australian National University. And one of the things that I love to hear was people saying for the Moku Lab, my students understand the concept so much better when I teach on Moku Lab than on traditional instruments because it's more intuitive, it's more flexible. If you need to zoom in on a waveform, students will just pinch to zoom naturally, which you can do on a Moku with the typepad interface, but mapping that through to an oscilloscope's seconds per division just takes that extra little step. Like it's not hard, but it's just that little bit of grit in the gears. So we started finding these educational institutions who just preferred teaching with Moku, even though it was quite expensive, they weren't using most of the features because of that intuition. So myself, I'm the product manager for Moku Go and our education verticals at Liquid Instruments. So Moku Go is my baby. We created that, launched it a little over a year ago now, starts well under $1,000, 599 I think is the current starting price there, 10 different instruments, and it's really designed to open opportunities in education and in the sort of maker space for people who maybe need to teach PID controllers one week but can't afford a PID lab or even things like spectrum analyzers. As an undergrad, maybe I touched the spectrum analyzer two or three times because it was just this one expensive box in the corner of a room. And with the Moku Go now, you can press a button, software-defined, high-quality spectrum analyzer just downloads into your Moku, and you can do all of that kind of stuff and teach things that you couldn't. So that's the pitch for Moku Go to round out that portfolio from you know, 599 and the education space through the low noise academic lab space in the middle and then up into industry at the top end for the Moku Pro. That makes sense. Now, Ben, I'm really also interested in the Moku Cloud Compile. So can you tell my audience about that solution? That's possibly my favorite feature of Moku at the moment. As I say, I have a background in university lecturing. One of the courses I taught was the Digital Logic HDL FPGA course. And we used to lose two to four weeks at the beginning of every semester, just getting a lot of the FPGA synthesis tools installed on students' laptops, getting them to understand what a driver was. Even if I gave them the driver, they wouldn't necessarily know how to work with it. And then you know, installing the drivers for the JTAG dongle to program the FPGAs and so on. So there was a high barrier to entry just to get to the point where you could program FPGAs. That on one side really converged with this market force on the other side, which was people saying, look, software-defined instrumentation is highly flexible, but here you are giving me software-defined instrumentation on an FPGA, and I can't program the FPGA. Like Your instruments are great, but what if I need a little bit more than that? So again, last year, last year was a very busy year for us. Last year, we launched the beta of Moku Cloud Compile, which is just coming out of beta soon. And the idea there is that people, students, industry, academics, whoever needs just that little extra bit of logic can go on to Moku Cloud Compile, which is a web app. They can write their VHDL Verilog code in that interface and then deploy it straight into your signal processing chain on the Moku. So if you've got a PID controller in the Moku, which is something that we've written, you can then put something on the front end that maybe is a driver that talks to an SPI temperature sensor as the input to your PID controller And then something on the output that maybe converts that into a motor control signal on the output. Or we had someone the other day who really struggled to control their, it was an optical system actually, struggled to control their optical system because their error signal wasn't linear, it was highly nonlinear. So they wrote a little Moku Cloud Compile box that took the nonlinear signal, linearized it according to the parameters of the plant and then pass that linearized version into the PID controller for control. It's one of these things, I have no idea how people are going to use it, all the different ways people are going to use it, and that really excites me. It's just adding that little bit of uh, garnish, that little bit of extra spice on top of our core instrumentation. 
I love that. That's fantastic. Now, I can see how your technologies could cause disruption in the test and measurement arena, Ben. Can you address that? I mean, I hope they do. That's why we're here to, as I say, swing for the fences. We think software-defined instrumentation, and particularly this software-defined instrumentation on a chip running inside of the device for maximum power, maximum flexibility, maximum performance, we think that that's the way of the future. But we also think that what that enables in terms of the user interface and the data sharing and the instrument sharing, that kind of highly connected data environment is just through everything else at the moment. The apps on your phone, some of them use data for evil as well as good. We're trying to use data for good, but data is definitely a currency here. So we see other competitors, I suppose, or incumbents in the market moving this direction as well. You know, Tektronix has like a tech drive cloud service. We see people like Keysight trying to get into that space as well. But we're built from the ground up to really leverage this software defined instrumentation on chip in a way that we don't think anyone else can. And certainly we think we've stolen a march on them there. 20 years from now, who knows? I think everything will be similar to this in one way or another. And we hope that we're right there at the forefront of it still. I think you're right, Ben. Now, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So, Ben, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard post-COVID off-the-cuff question. So, a lot of us can't have our favorite foods these days because of lockdown, because our country is closed in essence. We can't get to that country. We need a passport. The restaurant's closed, whatever it is. So, Ben, if you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter where on the planet it's from, what would you have? I'm sure the more I think about it, the more different answers I could come up with. But the one that came straight to mind there was a good Japanese katsu curry in a little corner sort of booth in a back alley in Kyoto or something. That's what I feel like right now. That's great. I've gotten lots of Japan answers, but I have not got a chicken katsu. And yes, possibly there's like three people in the spot. (laughs) The guy serving you and two other people. I love it. I love it, Ben. Awesome. Well, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. No worries at all, Amelia. Really enjoyed myself. Thanks for the opportunity. So what if we could build microprocessors out of plastic that cost less than a penny a piece? Well, that is indeed what a team of researchers at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign did. With the help of a British company called Pragmatic Semiconductor that specializes in flexible electronics. And what they created is now called Flexicores. And they are the first commercially viable plastic, flexible microprocessor chips. So... The motivation behind the creation of these chips lies in flexibility. Sure, silicon is great for a lot of applications, but it isn't exactly flexible. Rakesh Kumar, a professor of electrical and computer engineering and researcher at the Coordinated Science Lab at UIUC, explains the goal of their research like this. The challenge has been creating a processor that can be both cheaply produced and flexible enough to fit snugly even against uneven surfaces on our body, packages, or beer bottles. Okay, so what are we really talking about here? These flexicore transistors are actually made with indium gallium zinc oxide, which works even when they are bent and is compatible with plastic. Now, the yield here is interesting. This team from UIUC tested both 4-bit and 8-bit processors and managed to produce a yield of 81% of those 4-bit processors. This 4-bit processor includes 2,104 devices, which includes transistors and resistors. Now, I hear you loud and clear, my fish frying audience, but what about those plastic arm processors that were rolled out last year? Well, yes, those devices are much bigger. They run about 56,000 devices, which is, of course, much, much more than these flexicores. But ARM has yet to show that their processors can run on multiple programs or be manufactured at scale. And if we keep that penny price point in mind, 
keeping that gate count low in the flexicores is key. Kumar says this about the future of these flexicore chips. These chips combine the flexibility and cost benefits of plastic technology with the high yield and low bill of materials enabled by our architecture. It will be interesting to see where they can go from here. And yes, yes it will be. Kumar and his team will also be presenting their research at the International Symposium on Computer Architecture later this month. But for now, if you'd like even more information about this study, I've included a link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of July 1st, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.